to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture says contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints when we think about god's revelation to mankind how wonderful it is that he has revealed his divine will to us as jude 3 tells us but we also have the the emphasis and the encouragement to contend earnestly that is we must stand up for and fight for the faith especially when false doctrine is taught. We welcome you today to our series of lessons on answering denominational doctrine. Today we're going to consider the doctrines of the Mormon church and we're going to examine those and see if they're true, if they have good evidence behind them, and if they are lined up with the teaching of the Bible. And so we encourage you to have your Bible, find that, have it handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God together today. As always, we're so glad that you joined us for our study together today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. Friend, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, in your area. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, who are concerned about lost souls, and who would be happy to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. As always, we want to help you in your study of the Word of God in any way we can. We invite you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have DVDs and lessons you can download, as well as audio lessons and a whole lot of written material as well. All of it's free of charge. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and we'd love to help you with that. And with the move toward technology, we also have apps available both for Android and, of course, for your iPhone that you can get from the Apple or the Google Play Store. And so we encourage you to download the Gospel of Christ app as well. Today we're going to be thinking about the Word of God in contrast to some of the denominational teachings or some of the doctrines of the Mormon church. But friend, as we do this, uh, I hope you'll listen real carefully to our intent and to our motive. There are good, kind, sincere, loving people in every religious group. Friend, we realize that, we recognize that, we are not trying to impugn the character of anyone as it relates to that. As we discuss these doctrines, it's not about men and it's not about people, it's about what does the Bible say. And so that's our intent and our motive. But also realize this, friend, we're saying these things because we love God and we love the Scriptures. The Bible is God's inspired Word. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Only those who stay true to it can be saved and live with God eternally. Matthew 7, verse 21. And an error and false teaching will ultimately cause people to be lost and separated from God. And so we're concerned about what God and the Bible says. But friend, we also love you. We love the souls of men and women. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The Bible clearly says, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, 1 Timothy t clearly teaches that as well in the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4 clearly teaches that idea. And, and we also want men and women to be saved. And so we say these things out of a love for God and out of a love for lost souls. And when we say Mormon doctrine or Jehovah's do Jehovah Witness doctrine or Baptist doctrine may teach these things, friend, it's not as though we're angry or we're, you know, we're trying to impugn or make fun of at all. We want to point out what that says versus what the Bible. And friend, we need to have the attitude and mindset of Jeremiah 37 verse 17. Is there any word from the Lord? Or as Paul said in Romans 4, verse 3, what does the Scripture say? On the day of judgment, according to John 12, verse 48, I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. That's what's supreme, and that's what really matters. 
as you think about the doctrines of the Mormon church, it is necessary and essential for us to understand that a big claim and a big part, a major part of the Mormon doctrine and the Book of Mormon revolves around Joseph Smith being a prophet from God. Joseph claimed that in Palmyra, New York, he received a revelation by the angel Moroni that he looked into the Urim and the Thummim and that he got his revelation divinely from God and that he was a prophet of Almighty God. And so let's consider, is that true? Was Joseph Smith actually a prophet from God? Well, what do we know about a prophet first of all? Would you consider with me the words of Deuteronomy 18 verse 22. God says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And so clearly in the Bible we are taught when a prophet claims to speak on behalf of God, if what he says doesn't happen, if it doesn't come true, you can know he's lying and know he's not from God. Friend, on multiple accounts, we say this in kindness, but on multiple documented accounts, Joseph Smith said things that did not happen, that were so wild and far-fetched and proven to be untrue that he, according to the Bible, should not be recognized as a prophet of God. Let me give you an example. Quoted from Oliver B. Huntington, who was a follower of Joseph Smith in his journals, volume 11, page 166, he says this, The wildest of all of Joseph's prophecies concerns the moon being populated. And you can find this from multiple sources as being true. Joseph fabricated a story that the moon was supposedly populated with people who were six foot tall, dressed like Quakers, and lived to be a thousand years old. Now, in years before moon exploration, in years before the spacecraft going to the moon, you can say that and nobody can really refute that. But friend, when you get telescopes, when you send men to the moon, when we have searched that out, we can know that's not true. And yet he claimed that. He made that statement. It's a documented prophecy as it were. And what does Deuteronomy 18.22 say? If a prophet claims to say that, he claims to be a prophet of God, and it's not true or it doesn't happen, you don't worry about what that prophet says. He's not speaking on behalf of God. Let me give you another example. Joseph once prophesied that God told him to send David Whitmer and Oliver Crowdy to Toronto, Canada to sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon. These two men were unable to sell the copyright and so they returned and they questioned Joseph about this revelation. His answer is probably one of the uh, truest things he said about himself and about his revelation. Joseph said, and it stands, it stands as a striking statement about all of his prophecies or teachings, he said this, some revelations are of God, some revelations are of men, and some revelations are of the devil. It's quoted by David Whitmer in his address to all believers in Christ, page 133 in that document. And so here are two men who are very close to day, uh, Joseph Smith. And he said, hey, I messed up. Some come from God, some come from men, some come from the devil. Wait a minute now. He claimed that he had been sent that message from God telling them to go sell uh, the copyright to the Book of Mormon. Do we remember again? What Deuteronomy 18.22 says, If a prophet speaks presumptuously in my name, God said basically, you can know he's not my prophet. Joseph Smith, we've already noted, has two prophecies that do not line up with those things. All right, let me give you another one. And this is something you see happen quite regularly throughout history. In the History of the Church, Volume 2, page 182, Joseph Smith prophesied that the Lord would return in 1835. Then it was going to be 1843. Then he changed that to 1891. Well, friend, we're still here. Lord didn't come in 1835 as he prophesied. Lord didn't come in 1843 as he prophesied. And the Lord didn't come in 1891. Joseph prophesied as a prophet of God, those things were going to happen. They did not happen. Therefore, what? Joseph Smith is not a prophet of God. 
Friend, the Book of Mormon is his fabrication. The Book of Mormon did not come from the mind of God. It came from the mind of Joseph Smith. Here's another one. At one point, Joseph Smith made the bold claim that neither the rage of devils nor the malice of men shall ever cause him to fall by the hand of his enemies until he has seen Christ in the flesh at his final coming. Now, Oliver Crowdery uh, quotes this in defense of his grounds for separating himself from the Latter-day Saints, uh, written in 1839, page 1. Yet Joseph Smith claimed that. He prophesied that. He said it was true. And yet, we know that's not true. He died by the hands of his enemies, and ultimately he did not see Christ in the flesh. And so, why say all this? Friend, we've got nothing personal against Joseph Smith, but he prophesied things. God says it's a, if a prophet says it and it doesn't come true, he's not a prophet of mine. Therefore, Joseph Smith's false prophecies prove beyond a shadow of a doubt he is not a prophet of Almighty God. All right, let's take just a moment then to examine uh, the Book of Mormon and see, is it, does it hold up to scrutiny? Is it something that can stand the test of looking at the evidence and see if it's true? The Book of Mormon, as you may or may not know, was uh, allegedly given to Joseph Smith by the angel Moroni in Palmyra, New York in 1820. The angel then directed Joseph Smith to a stone box, supposedly, that contained two golden plates and also the Urim and the Thummim, which are mentioned in the Old Testament uh, on a breastplate. And so, uh, for translating, the Book of Mormon was allegedly completed in 1830. It claims to be another revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Native Americans of North America. Now, friend, in telling this history of it, there's something very important that comes out. As I hold in my hand today a copy of the Book of Mormon, I want you to notice what it says on the very front of this. Notice right there. The Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Friend, as you read the Bible, there are serious problems with another testament or another gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verses 6 through 9 clearly says, I, I plead with you, brethren, that they, they bring no other doctrine. If we or an angel of heaven bring to you any other gospel than that we've preached, let him be accursed. There's no other gospel is what Paul says in Galatians 1 verses 6 through 9. And so when Joseph Smith wrote this, put right on the front, another testament or another gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet the Bible clearly teaches there is no other gospel. There's one gospel, and that is the faith, the one faith, Ephesians 4, 4, given by our Lord and Savior. But as you think about the authorship of the Book of Mormon, consider this also. The authorship of the Book of Mormon is clearly seen in its original title page. We're asking the basic question, who is the author? Who's the originator? Where did the Book of Mormon come from? Well, you can clearly see that in its original 1830 title page. And I want to show you that. This tells us who the Book of Mormon really is from. Notice this title page. The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of ne Nephi. Now watch this. Notice just a couple of paragraphs down. By Joseph Smith, Jr., author and proprietor. Who wrote it? Who put it together? Well, Joseph Smith clearly says he did. This is not from God. This is not something that claims to be original from God in its original giving. And so as we think about the Book of Mormon, there's a lot of things associated with it that are already raised great questions in our mind. But friend, as you think about the Book of Mormon, please realize this also. When one examines the Book of Mormon, uh, the Book of Mormon does not add up to what we know is scientifically accurate, what is uh, true with common sense and true with logic as it relates to these things. Let me give you just a couple of examples. We won't mention all the verses related to this or won't read all of them, but just mention a few to you. Uh, the Book of Mormon in Alma chapter 24, verse number 16, says that burying swords in the earth will actually keep them bright and unrusted. Now, friend, I want you to think about that for just a minute. If I've got a, a sword, metal sword, is it actually the case 
that if I take that sword and I bury it in the earth, that it's going to keep it bright and unrusted? Well, that's what the Book of Mormon claims in Alma chapter 24, verse 16. And yet we know that's not the case. Burying a sword in the dirt is actually going to accelerate its rust. It's actually going to make it rust more. And so scientifically, it just doesn't add up with what we know to be true. According to the Book of Mormon, leprosy as a disease occurred in the Americas in 34 AD. This is 3rd Nephi 17, verse number 7, and yet we know the first documented case of leprosy in America wasn't until 1758, and so that's long before uh, in, any records or information related to that. Uh, the Mormon concept as it relates to certain things is, and this is a really amazing one, is that God cursed the Indians with dark skin. And anyone who marries an Indian would also be cursed, have that same curse of dark skin. We find that in multiple places. 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, Jacob chapter 3, verses 3 through 9. Uh, Mormon chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. And a host of others. And yet, we know that's not true. If this were true, if this were true, there'd be no part Indians. Anybody who married an Indian would be full in that sense. Only uh, those who uh, are different from that would be. And so the statement is just, when you look at genetics, it's just genetically false on so many different levels. Then we find this. The Book of Mormon says, when Indians accept the Mormon teachings, they will become a white and delightsome people. 2nd Nephi chapter 30 verses 5 through 7 and 3rd Nephi chapter 2 verse 15. Well friend, is that true? Is it, if a person is Native American, Indian, and they accept the teaching of the Book of Mormon, are they somehow going to become white and what they said delightsome? Well friend, there are no cases of history and history of this occurring. In fact, such change would imply a correlation between goodness and degrees of whiteness, meaning the more whiter you are, the more good you are. We know that's not true. People of all colors, races, backgrounds who obey the gospel, live according to teaching with God, regardless of their skin color, can be right and holy in the sight of God. We also learn, this is in an interesting one, the Book of Mormon teaches that baldness is actually caused by sin. 2 Nephi chapter 13 verse 24 references this idea that sin is somehow, that baldness is somehow associated with sin. And yet, scientifically, genetically, we know that's not true. Baldness is hereditary or some uh, chemical caused imbalance where one might lose their hair, but it's not due to sin. We just don't find that anywhere in, in the scriptures. And so we mention a multiplicity of these just simply to show that the Book of Mormon will claim that it is scientifically accurate and that the things mentioned in the Book of Mormon are scientifically accurate. And maybe you've even heard this. I've heard people who try to uh, represent the Book of Mormon actually say, and we've got sources to back that up. And sometimes they'll say the Smithsonian actually does. Friend, I want you to notice this letter from the actual Smithsonian Museum. You'll notice on this letter, as we've got it on the screen, National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institute. Here's the inquiry. Your recent inquiry concerning the Smithsonian Institution's alleged use of the Book of Mormon as a scientific guide has been received in the Smithsonian's Department of Anthropology. The Book of Mormon is a religious document and not a scientific guide. The Smithsonian Institution has never used it in the archaeological research and any information that you've received, to the contrary, is incorrect. Accurate information about the Smithsonian's position is contained in the enclosed statement regarding the Book of Mormon which was prepared to respond to numerous inquiries that the Smithsonian receives on this topic. And here is that document. Notice what they say. The statement regarding the Book of Mormon from the Smithsonian says, the Smithsonian Institution has never used the Book of Mormon in any way as a scientific guide. Smithsonian archaeologists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of the book. 
The physical type of the American Indian is basically mongoloid, being most closely related to that of people of eastern central area, different from what the Book of Mormon says. And, and it goes on to mention other things that they say in the Book of Mormon and things that they claim that the Smithsonian says are basically just not true. And so we say all that simply to mention. As we're thinking about the, the evidence, as we're considering the Book of Mormon, friend, it just doesn't add up with scientific evidence also, but probably more important and mostly uh, definitely more important to someone who is concerned about the Bible is this. Friend, listen real, real carefully. On multiple accounts, with great clarity, the Book of Mormon contradicts the teaching of God's divine Word. I want to show you those. I want you to see them for yourself. Uh, let me give you the prophecy and the promise. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. In Acts chapter 2, the Lord added to the church for the first time daily those who are being saved. And so anyone who reads the Bible in the New Testament realizes the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was established on Pentecost in A.D. 33. Here's the problem. The Book of Mormon says the church began in 147 B.C. That's what hundreds of years before the church actually began. And so let me give you that quote from the Book of Mormon. It comes from Mosiah, found in chapter 18. Mosiah chapter 18. I want you to notice verse number 17. And we'll put this on the screen. And they were called the church of God, or the church of Christ, from that time forward. And it came to pass that whoever was baptized by the power and authority of God was added to the church. Now, what's so significant about this is when you read the original introduction and title page uh, to the book of uh, Mosiah, it says from 130 to 124 uh, B.C. And so they're making this prophecies, uh, promises about things that happened right there to the Native Americans. And yet in Mosiah 18, 17, somewhere around the time frame 140, 130 B.C., they've got the church started. Well, friend, that completely contradicts the teaching of the Bible. I'll give you another example. Acts chapter 11, verse number 26. The Bible says they were called Christians first in Antioch. Somewhere around the time frame of 40 A.D., the Bible says they were called Christians first in Antioch. And yet in the Book of Mormon, uh, the Book of Alma, supposedly written around 73 B.C., Nephites are called Christians 73, at least 100 years before Acts 11:27, And so we quote this for you. The book of Alma, chapter 46. I want you to listen to what it says in verses 13 through 16 about the Nephites, 73 B.C. Verse number 13 says, And he fastened on his headplate and his breastplate and his shields and girded on his armor about his loins. He took the pole which had the end thereof rent his coat. He called it the title of liberty. He bowed himself to the earth. He prayed mightily unto his God for the blessings of liberty to rest upon his brethren so long as there should be a band of Christians remain to possess the land. For thus were all true believers of Christ who belonged to the church of God, called by those who did not belong to the church, and those who did belong to the church were faithful. Yes, all those who were true believers in Christ took upon them gladly the name of Christ or Christians as they were called because of their belief in Christ who should come. Now friend, that sounds all good and well until you realize he's talking about the Nephites, 73 B.C., 100 to 110 years before Acts 11.26, allegedly. Well, friend, the Bible already said, first, they were called Christians in Antioch, not in 73 B.C. to the Nephites. Uh, the Bible says, for example, let me give you another one. Colossians 1.18, the Bible says, Jesus is the head of the church. And yet, in Doctrine and Covenants, another book written by Joseph Smith, claimed to be from God, it actually says that Joseph Smith is the head of the Mormon church. Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 28, I want you to notice verses 2 through 6. Listen to what it says about Joseph Smith. 
Doctrine and Covenants 28, verse number 2 says this, But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, No one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, except my servant Joseph Smith, for he receiveth them even as Moses. Now talking about Joseph Smith still, it says in verse 6, And thou shalt not command him who is at thy head and at the head of the church. Who's the head of the church there? Joseph Smith. Wait a minute now. Colossians 1.18. Jesus is the head of the church. And friend, there are so many. Matthew 2 verse 1, Jesus, according to the Bible, was born in Bethlehem. Alma chapter 7 verse number 10 has Jesus being born of Mary at Jerusalem. Well, that's just false, clearly false. Uh, Luke 23, 44, three hours of darkness according to the Bible. Heli chapter 14 verses 20 through 27 has three days of darkness. And, and the evidence could go on and on. But friend, we just want you to see as we think about this idea. As we think about the Mormon church, please realize this. Again, we have no hard feelings against any Mormon individual. We've got uh, no personal hard feelings against Joseph Smith. They're good, uh, good, hardworking people in the Mormon religion. But friend, you can look at the evidence and you can see for yourself that Joseph Smith was not a prophet of God that Joseph Smith did not give the Book of Mormon as another divine revelation, that the Book of Mormon contradicts the Bible on multiple occasions and logic and science and, and clear thinking. And so we say this simply to say, look at the evidence. Take an honest look at it. Take a critical, honest look at the evidence and see if these things are true. And friend, there is a host. I'm not talking about conjecture or opinions or ideas. There are a host of facts. We haven't even gotten to some of those today. There's a host of places, not only where it contradicts science and the Bible, the Book of Mormon contradicts science, the Bible, it also contradicts itself. Joseph will contradict his own prophecies on multiple occasions. And so friend, all we ask you to do is examine. Look at the evidence and see. Is the Mormon doctrine, is the Mormon church really the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, friend, really, it's another gospel, not the true gospel. It's a gospel made up and fabricated by Joseph Smith, and it should never stand next to the divine revealed will of God. The Book of Mormon cannot save. It is not from God. Only the Bible, the teachings of Christ, and New Testament Christianity can do that. And so we encourage you today just simply to examine the evidence and see. And as always, if we can help you further in your study of these issues, friend, we want you to know that we love you and God loves you. Won't you look for yourself? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.